Okay, welcome folks. This is Friday afternoon, April 16th. Um, and this is House Corrections and Institutions Committee. We're any folks, Karen? No, oh, okay. Any concerns, Linda, Mary? I don't see your faces. So, are there any concerns oh. there between you two? And no, them? not not at this point. Okay. Anything, Linda? She may not be hearing. Okay, so we have some questions here. Uh, Kurt and then Michael. Uh, Representative Dolan, did, did they, um, what, what happens if the victim really doesn't want to hear any more about it? Did, did you ask them about that? I did, I did, because that was one of my original concerns. And the piece that came up was that it could change along the way. And so by having, um, it's still there that they reach out that the state's attorney's victim advocate, it could be a simple phone call, a quick email, but it does give them the opportunity. Um, and I guess that they could at the beginning at sentencing, make it very clear, you know, I do not want to be content. I will not change my mind. They could say that at the beginning, but keeping this in there gives the opportunity. And some of the victims of probation, a lot of victims of cases that are settled in probation do not even register with Vans. And that's up to the victim to make that decision, correct? It's up to the victim to make that decision. Yeah. But how this is, is that the state's attorneys, if they, they would still send a letter or reach out to the contact information that they have available to them at sentencing. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question fully, Representative Taylor. I think so. So it says victim of record of a motion filed to reduce. So, so there is some record that has the victim's names in it. And at sentencing, see, this is make rid of the victim record of a motion. Okay, so when the when the um, when DOC files the motion for discharge, that's the state prosecutors would hear about it, mm -hmm. and at that point they would say, "We know the victims of record, so we'll notify them, even if they're not registered in vans." Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Hey, Michael. Yes, thanks. I was just, um, and you, you've heard me bring it up repeatedly, just the restitution on the individual's part. And I believe, I just wanted to see if everybody recalled if I heard it correctly, that I think it was Matt Valerio that said, and I'm still trying to find it in the new language, so I'm looking at the one of the old drafts, is that if they didn't make the victim whole through restitution or uh, that there was ways of going after them, like garnishing taxation, you know, any refunds or things like that. Did I, is that what I heard from them? Does do people recall hundred percent what? Yes, I remember that. And, and um, where was that? Cause I know. It was at the, it's at the end of section, it's section two. I'm just trying to find it on Bryn's draft, the way it's put together. I don't see. A probation, oh yeah, it's on section three. It's at the end of the new section three, and it's- a Oh, okay, it's the end of three now, okay, yeah. that's why- Probationer wouldn't be deemed, in a, would, shall not be deemed ineligible for- Okay, there we go, yep, yep. Unpaid restitution fees of sur surcharges, and if there are any, then then say they owe, owe um, say child support, or possibly they owe, um, income taxes or whatever it's taken out of that. Okay, so it has nothing to do in this, this this has nothing to do with the victim being repaid for their loss? No. No. This is to make sure that if there's fees that are um, charged from the court or surcharges that there's a way to recoup all that. Am, am I off base on that, Bryn? Well, it says the word restitution. I take that as payback to the victim in my brain, but maybe I'm, Bryn would know that better than I, I guess. I don't know. 
Brent, could you clarify? Yeah, so the orders um, for restitution are different. If a person is, is paying restitution directly to the victim, um, it may be that if they haven't completed that restitution, they are not deemed ineligible for this early um, release. But the restitution unit has um, is the unit that's responsible for collecting restitution from offenders. And they have civil enforcement remedies um, which include wage withholding, um, property, property liens, attachment and sale of assets, suspension of recreational licenses, um, and there may be other, other ways that they can obtain restitution as well. Because I just, I, like I, you've heard me probably repeatedly say, I'm, I was a victim of a crime. My house was broken and things were stolen. I never got a dime. And, and it, so it's a little raw with me when I see this sitting there, I would think you could understand how I could feel a little chapped about the fact that somebody could be let out when they owe people money for their, and you know, first of all, they violated my home. Second, they took stuff that didn't belong to them and I never got it back and, it, and I'm out, you know, I was out a couple, couple thousand dollars. Some stuff got returned, found a return, but one item was never returned that's worth in excess of $2,000 and I never got one penny, it's out of my hide. So um, hopefully that is, so it is simply, I guess, Brent, I guess I would ask you then, so it simply just says that it doesn't deem them ineligible, but it could still be a variable for saying, well, but you still owe 5,000 bucks. So you're going to still have that dangled over your head and you're not going to get out or off from probation yet, possibly. That's right. It's up, the judge has the discretion. Okay. So All right. Thank you. Yeah. That, that, that's fine. All right. Thank you. Uh, Sarah. Yeah, I, I just, I wanted to follow up because I remember this coming up and I don't know if it was with um, this, the attorney general's office, but are those restitutions, just so I'm clear, are those are those set like when somebody gets a sentence, like what that restitution is, Bryn? Is that part of, that's my recollection that that was also part of the, the, part sentencing. Of the sentencing. Yes. Okay. So if somebody, if, if, some, if somebody is, is owed restitution or somebody has to pay restitution that would be really clear what the fine. Yeah. yes yeah i just i hear i hear i hear uh there is a restitution order that's issued by the court okay thank you that's okay i'm here i just had to check something i'm here okay uh linda um, thank you. So, Bryn, just on the restitution issue, could you just re-clarify for me? Um, the judge has the discretion, provided the state attorney brings an action. Otherwise, it's automatically administratively dissolved. So there is no discretion anymore, correct? Well, the judge has the discretion in terms of the criteria that are in B1A and B. So the, ju the judge, so the, the commissioner first has the discretion when they're reviewing the eligibility criteria. And then the judge later, once the, once the motion is filed, has to make those determinations about um, the, the danger that the probationer poses and also whether they're um, substantially in compliance with their conditions. So but doesn't that only happen if the state attorney brings an action if the state attorney doesn't bring an action the way I understood it, the way the judge said it, it shall be administratively dissolved. So with it, nothing happens within those 21 days, it doesn't matter. It's going away. The, right. I understand what you're saying. So the, so the prosecutor has to seek that continuance in order for the criteria to be reviewed by the judge. Is that what you mean? Right. So it, exactly. So it, 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 once it, the probation it, you know, request is filed, if the state attorney doesn't do anything, nobody cares about the rest of the stuff because it's administratively going to happen. It's going to be a stamp by the judge because it shall declare it. Right. So yes, that's correct. So the, so the, the idea is that the, the, prosecutor follows, the prosecutor gets notice of the petition that's filed, and it's up to the prosecutor to, um, to oppose that 
motion if they if they see fit. And right, then the court uh, and that's paper. where I was get. That's where I was saying. So as far as the restitution issue, that doesn't even really come into play unless there's a motion filed by the state attorney. The criteria right. yeah. being right. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I still had that right. Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah. Out. Kurt. Yeah, I'm I'm still confused. Um, because okay, I'm on uh, duration of probation A, B, and C, uh, page two. So B says the commissioner. That's all about the discharge and whether the commissioner is going to request a discharge. But C is not part of that. And C just says you shall not be deemed ineligible because of restitution fees or surcharge. That doesn't give any discretion to the judge. I don't know. I don't understand your question. I'm sorry. Well, I, I think, I'm, that, I'm I think to... the, the point the point is that um, uh, failure to pay, I think the idea that was discussed in Senate Judiciary they have been discussing in a variety of bills about how um, failure to pay shouldn't um, mean that you continue to be supervised because it doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily impact your risk of reoffense if you can't pay. Okay. So um, they wanted to make it clear that the midpoint review doesn't um, isn't is you're not ineligible for this midpoint discharge if you can't pay. And and when you say ineligible, there's two places where eligibility is kind of determined one at the by the DOC and the other when it comes to the judge I guess the L so when the judge gets it after the prosecution the uh, state's attorneys have decided to contest it this to me is saying the judge can't say you still owe restitution fees or discharge so therefore I will not put you on probation this says you can't use those criteria to keep a person from probation right right it's making it clear because okay. the the criteria are there for the judge, it's automatic unless there's a unless the pro, the prosecutor files a motion, and then the judge goes through the criteria. So this is there to make it clear that it's not the a court couldn't use that as a as a rationale for keeping a person on on probation if they meet the other other criteria. Okay, okay. So the 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 judge has discretion in with regard to other criteria but it as far as restitution fees and surcharges the judge can't yeah. say you can't okay that's, that's, that's right fine. that doesn't make a person ineligible right okay good yeah, thank you that all the other criteria that shouldn't hold them back from being discharged okay i i'm sorry i just keep thinking you know this last episode on the floor where people are picking through things and asking questions i keep thinking Boy, you know, we really should understand this stuff before it comes to the floor. So if somebody says, well, wait a minute, what, what's the story with the restitution? Then somebody's going to, would be nice to be able to explain it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think I got it. Okay. Michael. Yeah, I'm sorry to keep beating the dead horse here, but so I make sure I'm hearing this right. So they, in essence, yes, it's not going to be used as a criteria, but should it be a criteria? Or if not, it, does it just have a potential? Is there even potential for it to just go like I guess in my case, just go bye bye, nothing, and nothing ever. The person never becomes made whole, or if I'm using the right terminology, or I mean, so maybe do we think about should it be a criteria? I mean, because I guess in my mind they sort of haven't met conditions, it, and but I mean I know the way this is written, it does. It's not a condition, but should it be? I mean because. And again, maybe I get it. And again, maybe I'm the lone ranger that's raw about it that because I've been a victim of a crime where I, I didn't get made whole, but it seems to me, um, I mean, if I wrong somebody, if I get in a, a car accident with somebody, I make them whole by my insurance covering them. I pay my deductible and they get their car fixed. If, I don't know if that's a great analogy, but I'm kind of, you know what I mean? I, I'm, I'm not, I guess I'm not satisfied. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not here I, I it sticks in my craw I guess that that wouldn't be a criteria and if I'm alone I, maybe I'd have to be the outlier and I say I can't support it I don't know but it, it just kind of I need to hear something that tells me more that 
that that's and again maybe i maybe mine fell through the cracks maybe i'm the outlier that didn't get made whole um so i'm hanging on to that um but i don't know what else can be told to me to make me feel better about it <laughs> i don't know any other way to put it that's just kind of telling you how i raw feel about the whole the whole scenario so these decisions initial decisions and determination of a person's probation or sentence is all done in the courts, correct, Bryn? So any restitution or fees or surcharges would be set at the time of sentencing, correct? Yeah, um, primarily, I'm not sure about surcharges if, if, if that is associated with a non-payment, but yes, essentially that's a, that's a, oh. uh, those are court ordered associated fines and stuff, yes. So, and the other thing that I heard Bryn saying as well, that some institutions is really looking at the risk uh, of a person's um, behavior, particularly to reoffend. And they, in the Senate judiciary feel that restitution or fees or sur surcharges are not indicative of that risk. And they didn't, if someone is showing a low risk and they're abiding, they didn't feel that fees or surcharges should hold them back from, from uh, going forward in their life in terms of working through the sentence that was given them. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and just a reminder that this, if you remember, this came from, this was a part of the Justice Reinvestment II um, research that was done. And I know it's it's getting back there in time now, but um, this was a part of the original recommendation from the Justice Center um, to amend the way that, that the state dealt with probationers. Um, so this bill is really a reflection of, of um, the stakeholder agreement after, after you pushed it off last year after Justice Reinvestment II, you couldn't really quite figure out stakeholders couldn't quite agree on how to deal with the probation issue. Mm -hmm. So um, this is really kind of a holdover from the justice reinvestment work that was done last year. I mean, that's all fine and dandy that that's how they feel, but they're one stakeholder, in my opinion. So we're going to move on here because we have more questions. Uh, Karen and then Lynn. Well, yeah. I just, I just have to say, I've got, I have an objection with that not being a criteria, I guess, at this point, I, I, I don't feel like I've gotten a good, I'm not, and I'm not saying people are evading it or not answering. I just don't know how to be convinced otherwise that I, I don't know. I got to think on it. Sometimes things you can't get convinced. Uh, Karen, Lynn, Michelle, and Kirk. I knew there was more that came in. So Karen. Yes, so I was, I was going to share some of my experiences with the restitution and restitution unit. It's something that I work a lot on in my work with the Community Justice Center. And um, so I would say the restitution unit, it, it is a separate piece of it. And they really work on making sure restitution is collected. And so restitution is issued at the time of sentencing. So that's where it is important to make sure victims have a voice to be able to advocate and say like, I want restitution to be a part of this sentence. And as long as it's a part of the sentence, the restitution unit is doing everything they can to collect that. And um, so I just wanna put that faith in the restitution unit that as long as restitution is there at sentencing, it can be a payment plan. They could, like we said, you know, um, take it out of checks and stuff. Like there is a way um, it can be paused for a bit. Like if somebody loses their job and then taken back, they are very creative in making sure that it is paid. Um, the other piece of that is I think that there is the risk piece of like say people meet all of their terms, the counseling, the programming, all of that, that there is the data of if you keep somebody on probation, it's not just them making their payments isn't going to do it, um, isn't going to increase their risk. And so that's a reason to it. It's, for some people, I think we heard from the person who was on probation, like their anxiety of being on there is hard. So if you remove that barrier, it actually makes it so they're more productive and can do better, which might help with making payments. And then the other thing that I'll throw in there, I don't know, I'm not obviously a judge, but I could see how a judge might interpret it as, okay, I can't look at the restitution payments as an indicator, but if somebody is constantly 
late on their payments or disruptive about making payments, like that could be something that they might be able to consider, not the actual payments themselves. So I just feel like there is a solid program in place with that. And um, I think the piece is at sentencing, making sure that restitution is con included. So you're, you're saying, Karen, that the victim right. would be considered there. Yeah. Okay. So All right. Thank you. More questions here. Lynn and then Michelle and Kurt, your hand was up and then went down. So Yeah, uh, it's taken care of. Okay. Carrie, uh, Representative Dolan did a better job than I would have. <laughs> so where was I? Lynn and then Which me. Uh, I sort of have to agree with Michael. Why have restitutions and if nobody's going to enforce them? I mean, it's like a child. If you tell them they're not supposed to do something and this is what's going to happen, if they do it anyway, you sort of have to follow through. And um, I don't know. I know it's not up to us. I know the judge and the courts do this. But to me, if you asked for a restitution, you should have to do it. And uh, Karen also said that people are trying and that's fine. But I sort of have to agree with Mike, you know, hey, let's make them do what they're supposed to have done. They probably got into this mess from doing something they shouldn't have been doing. So anyhow, I'll be quiet, thank you. <laughs> so does the restitution piece and all of that go through a separate unit of the court? Is that what you mentioned, Bryn? Yeah, the restitution unit is responsible. Um, it's not the court, it, it's the restitution unit that in, ensures that the person um, pays their restitution. And like I mentioned earlier, they have civil remedies. So it, it ultimately it may be a court that um, enforces the payment plan if a person isn't paying, but the criminal court isn't the one that goes after the person. Um, so I hear the concern about not having criminal court supervision over a person is, is concerning to some, but, um, but there, I think, I imagine that the restitution unit really looks at themselves as being quite distinct and separate from the, from the criminal court overseeing a probationer. And they are the ones that are enforcing those uh, restitution orders. So could a restitution have been made in a different form and the victim not know it? Do you know that answer? If it um, garnered wages or, or um, taxes of some kind? That is how restitution is sometimes paid if the person isn't um, voluntarily paying it or able to pay it. Mm -hmm. But I don't know about if the victim knows that or not, that, that I don't know. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, I was just going to speak uh, somewhat along the lines to what Karen was saying to, uh, to some of Michael's concerns. I mean, when you look at the, the time after a crime has been committed, uh, one of the things that happens in, in my experience in restorative justice is that sometimes people are doing work in, respond, in, in response for part of their sentence. It's not just about cash. So for example, I worked with youth uh, for a number of years and I, I worked with a young man who had uh, committed some vandalism and he was sentenced to doing a very extensive amount of community service, part of it at the business that he had done the vandalism at. It wasn't exactly a calculation of, oh, he damaged $500 worth of things, so he's doing $500 worth of labor. Like you couldn't, it, it, it's not as clear as that, but the idea was he was gonna be giving back to the person that he harmed through his actions and healing the harm in that way. So, I mean, I think there are different ways that justice can be done. And it sounds like for you, Michael, you were left really unsatisfied with the way your situation was resolved. But my experience, and I think also for Karen, working at a community justice center, there are a lot of creative ways that the justice system can work to help people repair harm. And I think in a lot of cases, from what I gather in my experience recently, and, and from what we've heard from some of our other people giving testimony, the system often does work to hold people accountable and have them follow through with those commitments. So it feels to me, I, would, I personally am ready to trust the system to work in these cases, to come up with something that is fair and that is going to work in the interests of the individual and, and in the community. Yeah, hearing those kind of things is good for what you said, Michelle, and what you said, Karen. That's that's better, and I'm just hopes. I'm in hopes that maybe mine fell through the cracks and nothing got done. Then, based on what the two of you are saying, so thank you for that for that input. So, other folks, 
Is this going to derail the bill for folks, this particular section? Okay. Other concerns of the bill before we, Linda, did you have anything you wanted to say? Shh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the only, and then has nothing to do with derailing the bill at all. The only concern I have is that word shall by the judge at the first paragraph. I know it was one judge who said he could live with shall. I know there's a lot of judges who probably couldn't. I would prefer may, only because that forcing something into administrative rubber stamp kind of bothers me. But um, all of these other questions that have arisen would be, able to be looked at if it was May up there versus shop. But that's just my position it has nothing to do with derailing the bill. I think the well, testimony, I understand what you're saying, Linda, but I think on the other end of that, people are trying to make sure that there's geographic continuity throughout, throughout the legal system in terms of depending oh. on what court you're in, that everyone is treated the same. Absolutely, I get that. But I, when I'm hearing all these other questions down at the lower end, they could be dealt with up there if the judge wanted to say, hey, you know what, restitution's fine, it's good the way it is. As opposed to somebody saying, well, how do I come in as a third party somehow and intervene? You know, so it, it, it's just a strong word, but it's okay. okay. So Kurt and then Karen. Uh, just a, a little, I need a little clarity because I don't, I'm not familiar with the Center for Crime Victim Services. Is that within the courts? Is it separate from the courts? Where, where is that in the whole uh, judicial system? Do you know, Bryn, or is that, Karen, I know you work pretty intimately with some of this. So maybe, Karen? I know, and I um, was just looking up the link for, I just know it as Center for Crime Victim Services. I don't know what department it falls under. So maybe Bryn has a clearer. So it's a standalone um, agency that works with other agencies. So I, the restitution unit is a part of the center. Um, and my understanding is that they work with the prosecutor's offices um, to make sure that uh, it, notifications are getting to victims and all of that. Um, but they are an independent. They, they they stand on their own. Um, I'm not a total expert on this, so forgive me if that's not a great answer. Um, but that's that's kind of the extent of my knowledge about crime victim services. Just so, okay. is, are they similar to like the network? Hmm. No. Karen? No, they're they're different. And one thing okay, I'm not going out. down that road. <laughs> okay, I'm not going down that road. Okay. So Karen, you had your hand up. Was it for something else? Yes, I. Um, just wanted to follow up to Representative Morgan's piece because I think that's an important piece that we're learning about going through some of these bills is the victim voice in this. And so um, I know we have a full plate this year, but thinking for next year of like ways that we can make sure that victim voice is included along the way, because I think that is where often the justice system, you know, it, it doesn't serve the victims well. So I think with this bill, how we've added that piece of making sure that victims know upfront about this whole process is key. Because I think as Representative Morgan shared, like if you're not in the loop of knowing all these different opportunities and pieces that are available, you can really fall through the cracks and it's, it's not okay. Um, and so I, I just wanna put that on our radar screen to have us keep having that conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Michael. So can we talk about what Linda said? I like the idea of May. That, I reread that with May and that makes me feel a whole lot better. Is that gonna be any big deal if we put May instead of shall? I, I'm a whole lot yeah. more on board with May. We'll come back as a shall. This is a Senate bill. It's amending a Senate bill. Mm -hmm. It will come back with a May. I guarantee it. Oh, you think they're going to insert May? No, no, you they, said it, they'll come back. I mean, as a they'll shall. come back as a shall. They won't. They won't. They won't accept a may. How do we know that? Because they passed it over to us with a shall. That's that was pretty strong. That the, this is the whole reason. 
Maybe um, they won't notice. <laughs> right. Of the report. This is from last year. We had the Justice Center do a report back, work on this. This was a recommendation. Senate Judiciary has vetted this and worked it through. They felt strongly about it. This is for equal justice across the state. So you don't have one judge doing one thing and another judge doing something different. Um, and when it comes over an aversion, people, they're gonna stick by it. Well, but we're changing other things in it, aren't we? We're clarifying to really make sure that victims are notified up front and that tracks what we did in S18 for that. And that was a request of the victims group. So what if we put it in there and they, so if they do send it back with that change, I mean, they're gonna, they're gonna go back to us one more time anyway, right? Let's see if we have the votes in the committee first to change it from shall to, to may. This committee first, that would be the first process. How many folks would like to turn the shell to a May for a straw vote at this point? Well, uh, just a second. But, uh, <laughs> straw vote. I mean, I'm just trying to get through this. Yeah, but I think it would be good to, to explain a little more of, of the process. I don't know whether Representative Morgan knows the whole process. I mean, what you say is true. We could send to the Senate. You mean? We could send it back to the Senate. They could send, they could change it back to shall or may. We could go, you can only go back and forth so many times and then there would have to be a committee of conference. And then you'd get into haggling about whether it should be shall or whether it should be may or what else could be given up or what should. So it's a question of whether we want to go down that long path of going back and forth and, and negotiating. But it, it, I mean, there's nothing that says we can't. It's just a question of, whether it's worth it and whether and how it'll ultimately come out. It sounds like the Senate is pretty adamant that they would like to have shall in there. And so it would probably, as the chair says, come back as shall, and then we'd have to deal with it again and see whether we, whether we want to uh, push it to the point of a conference committee. And then you're, yeah. you know, and all this takes time. So it's, it's a question of whether it's worth it. And that's up to the committee. I mean, I can see that it's, it's, I see what you're saying, Kurt. Um, but I mean, have they specifically said to us that it's shall? I mean, I know they put that there, but I'm, do we know for a fact that that one word is a must do on their part? Yes. That was the that? original, that was the original request for the, well, for the bill. Rarely does the, rarely does the Senate use the word shall. They're usually a little bit more soft soaked and for them to use shell is usually they're pretty set for, for having that word used. Okay. All right. So are we okay with shell folks? Can, I just want to be really clear about there are many appearances of the word shell. So I just want to make sure that I'm following the committee. We're talking about in section four. Okay. Is that right? No. Section three, I believe. Section two. Well, it was two in the old one. It's now three. It's in three. Our I'm sorry. Yes. Now it's three. Yeah. Two point I thought we were talking about section three, page two, line 10. Yes. Yeah, yeah the old one. Yeah. No, the current one. Page two, section three. We are on draft 2.1. Yes. This draft we're working on. 2.1, section three, page two, section three, line 10. The sentencing court shall terminate probation and discharge if the following A, B, and C are in place. So, so then we've got some levels of proof there that have to be met before. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I was, I was thinking substituting May for page three, line five, a probationer may not be deemed ineligible. But anyway, it, I'm probably slicing. Are you still on the restitution piece? Yeah. 
Well, that's yeah. not going to come back as a may because of testimony that the Bryn gave that judiciary is looking at a lot of legislation about fees and surcharges that that wouldn't hold people back from um, some of their sentencing because it's sentencing is based on risk. So they're definitely not going to be changing that one. Yeah, well, it it uh, yeah, I can see what but I see what Sarah's saying. Shall is used in multiple places here, but it could be substituted that word in multiple places. But all right, we'll let's press forward. I guess as far as I, it is what it is. I'll have to either live it or not live it. Thank you, uh, Linda. It just so for a representative copy, it was on line ten. It was just regarding the administration, the administratively dissolution of the judge. That's it. So it's it, if you changed it to May, it could deal with a lot of these other issues, but it's not. <laughs> it was just a clarification from me. Okay, <laughs> don't take it beyond that. Okay, so whoever uh, argues this, presents this on the floor, if anybody asks you that, and you have a problem, yep. <laughs> and I, I just misunderstood which, which piece Linda was talking about, so now I see it, I got it. Okay, folks, can we start the line by line at the very <laughs> beginning, and we are on draft 2.1, okay? 2.1 because Bryn has to go somewhere. So I'd like Bryn to be around if possible. So let's start page one, section one is the purpose of probation. Representative Emmons, are you wanting something from me right now or are you all just reading the bill? We're just reading the bill okay. line by line, but I, I know you have to be somewhere soon and I just want to get through it in case we need you to clarify something but I'm doing the line by line <laughs> thank you Brian so section two this is the new piece that we worked up at the request of the victims um, services that at the sentencing the prosecution would notify the victims that midpoint review is available might be available Okay, anything from folks? Section three, this is the duration of probation. And this sets up the motion to discharge in B1. So one of the conditions you have to, the state's attorney has to prove the person's not a risk to the victim or the community, um, or they have, has to also, has to prove by a higher standard of proof that the person is not in compliance with their conditions of probation that are related to the rehab of the person, the victim or the community. Anything else in section three? Section four goes over to page four, the new piece. Is the conditions of probation and midpoint review. And at the top of page four, you've got the review and the re recommendations for discharge of the program. And it says the DOC would file a motion 
if the person has not been found to violate conditions of probation in the six months prior, hasn't been sentenced to certain crimes that are listed here, and has completed those rehabilitated and risk services, risk reduction services that were a condition of their probation. And we had the new language there. Question, Madam Chair. Yeah, um, and those those crimes specified in uh, subsection B are those? Uh, remind me what those are. Are those the list? Just the listed crimes, the Big Twelve or something, or what? Are, what are those? Oh, I've I have a document that has them. If some, if you want me to send them around, because I I did look into those. Why don't you do that? That would help the reporter the bill. Yeah, they're would... both they're they're the first one. Subsection six is like domestic assault. Um, Subchapter seven is stalking. Chapter seventy two, they're all sexual assault, uh, aggravated sexual assault, assault with a child, lewd and lascivious conduct with a child. They're all um, sexual crime related. That would be great if you could send that around, Kurt. Thank yeah. you. That would be a help okay. to the reporter as well. Anything else on that section? So then you go to number two and three on top of page five. If a probationer doesn't meet that criteria or if the court denies the motion. second bite at the apple, so to speak. And then number three is where the prosecution, the state prosecutor would attempt to notify the victim at the time of the motion to discharge. Okay. And then number five is a report that DOC is gonna collect the data regarding these midpoint review, the number of folks um, of motions filed, the number of folks that have been reduced or terminated. And that report will be done by August of next year in the previous year. So it gives a good year of data collection. And then there might be some further recommendations of legislation. And then section six deals with the sentencing commission. I just sent that list out. Okay, thank you, Kurt. And that report will come back in October of this year. Madam Chair. Yes. I have a question on that. And I apologize mm -hmm. if we did hear, but did we hear anybody from the Sentencing Commission or? I asked, I remember I asked that question and I think uh, we didn't, we said Judge Zona with the head of the commission and I asked that question and it, I asked that of the judge, I believe. I asked that of somebody, of the judge. We didn't hear from them, did we? Did they hear this in the Senate? Yes. Yeah. This is a report. I mean, the report. question would be whether they were okay with doing the report, I'm assuming is what Rep Dolan yeah. is behind that question. I do have a note here that October 1st is doable. And I, that came from Judge Grierson, because I remember I did ask about that. I've got that in my notes. Yeah, it is doable. 
And I know from last year, if there were issues happening in the sentencing commission with their workload, that would have come to the surface when they were doing this bill, because there were some issues in 133 last year when we were working and there was a lot of requests of the sentencing commission and they said, wait a minute. So, so then this bill becomes effective July 1st of this year. So any outstanding questions before we move on to a vote? Okay. I would entertain a motion to vote out S45 favorably as amended. It would be draft 2.1. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we pass out S45 favorably and it would be draft number 2.1. Is there any further discussion? If not, Karen, please call the roll. Yes, Representative Taylor. The muted. Yes. Mute. Yeah, I, I, it takes me a little while to unmute. I'm slow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remember that, Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yes for Representative Taylor. Representative Sullivan. Yes. Representative Morgan. Yes. Representative Martel. Yes. Representative Dolan. Yes. Representative Campbell. Yes. Representative Boslin. Yes. Representative Bachelor. Yes. Representative Morrissey. Yes. Representative Coffey. Yes. And Representative Emmons. Yes. Okay, so I would like to have Karen be the reporter of this bill. If Karen, you feel up to it, and then you've worked in some of the probation world, has some understanding of it, we will give you backup. Trust me, we'll give you backup. Bryn can also help you as well for that. Um, so we need a clean copy of draft 2.1 to get down to the house clerk's office. Karen, you're the reporter. I'll give a heads up to uh, Betsy and Melissa. And then I'm not sure in this electronic world how everything works. I think Melissa will contact you, Karen, but you need to relay that you're the reporter and that the vote is 11-0-0. Okay. So let's shift gears before we break. Bryn, thank you. Have a nice weekend and we'll- Thank you. Have you too. Just, just think, weekend. Weekend. Bryn, you got nine minutes to call your own. Call it quick. I know, <laughs> nine <laughs> minutes on your own. Bye guys. Thank you. Madam Chair, may I ask a question? Yes. Is it likely this will be for Tuesday? Is that what I should prepare? It'll Wednesday. Be, I meant to say that I'll be on notice Tuesday. And maybe one thing you we might be able to do is just have a short, maybe folks short presentation in caucuses to see, but they may have a lot of items as well in both caucuses. So that, that kind of goes back and forth for that. Let me get an email out to Melissa here real quick. I can. Um, hopefully her email will show up. Yep. Oops, getting too many fours here. Um, I'm, I'm emailing Karen, uh, Karen, I'm emailing Melissa at the, um, clerk's office, and I've indicated, Karen, that you're the reporter. Okay. So she may connect with you, okay? Just notified them. Okay. 
And I think Bryn just sent out a clean copy as well. Okay, and that was sent to you, Karen, and to Phil. So that's the copy you're going to want um, to report on. And it's a strike off, so that will make it easy. Okay, and it will be printed in the calendar. So that just makes life easier for folks so that they don't have to go back to the original bill and then look at those particular sections that we amended, okay? Easy sounds wonderful. That's why I wanted to do a strike call because if we weren't in the Zoom world, it might be a little different, but in the Zoom world, it's just easier to do that. And Karen, I'll send you the list of witnesses. Yes, you're gonna need Thank that. Thank you. I'm going to be busy this weekend. Great. You'll be fine. So I just want to quickly shift gears uh, to S3 and just give you folks a heads up in terms of what's happening upstairs in house healthcare. They've really done a lot more work on this than we have, which I sort of appreciate because we've been a little tied up. But if you go to our webpage, um, we do have the document that Katie McLinn has been working on. She's their legal staff. Um, and healthcare is looking at this this afternoon was my understanding. It's listed under Bill Lippert. And they don't have the bill officially either. They're doing the same drive by we are. And uh, we're all trying to coordinate with, Senate, with House Judiciary because they're the ones that have the bill and House Judiciary as to our committee, as well as House Healthcare to look at section five and section six. So section five deals with that assessment of mental health services. And they've done some work on this. You can see it where it's highlighted. Um, we did hear testimony about the date that that should be extended out. Um, they put in January. What test was testified to us was April of 2022 by both the Commissioner of Corrections and the Commissioner of Mental Health. Uh, we sort of suggested March. And I see here they have January. So they're looking at it today, I believe. We may want to recommend maybe March, January might be too tight, but they may have different information than we do. So I'm not sure. They, they had talked, well, in uh, House Judiciary, they had talked about either six months or to a year. Right, right. So is this for the work study? This is the assessment of the mental health services. It's, it's not the forensic, it's section five. Oh, it, it's okay. the assessment of mental health services are being provided to folks who are incarcerated. And this is um, what Department of Corrections and Mental Health would do an inventory and evaluate those mental health services that are provided uh, within DOC. And there'd be a report to our respective committees. So the question is, when do we get that report and how long is it going to take them to do the work? And I think what healthcare committee has done is even extended a little bit in terms of what they look at. So Kurt, you have your hand up. There we go. Okay. <laughs> I need to be faster on the trigger for that. Yeah. Um, I, this doesn't deal with a date. It deals farther down. Do you want me to well, wait? Let's, let's wait because that's where I'm headed. Okay. So they wanted to be a little clearer in what was uh, inventoried and what was covered. Um, that was the one thing and they did add a few things. The other thing that they've done is they were concerned if you um, set the basis of uh, comparing what's offered within corrections and comparing that um, to see if they're different than services available in the community. We went through this with a concern of healthcare committee in the past where they're really concerned about community services for mental health. So they're wondering if that should be the baseline or not. Um, and I think some of their language may have addressed that. I have not had a walkthrough of this language either. 
Uh, Katie's the one who has drafted it. So I just wanted you folks to see it in concept. Um, I'd like to do a little further work on this more on Tuesday when we might be able to have Katie in or Bill Lippert to talk about it because they haven't finalized it upstairs either. They're working on it as a draft. So um, they do have here recognizing the comparison but does not necessarily establish the standard of care for best practices. That is new. And then they want to um, really see the comparison of the different types and frequencies and timeliness of mental health services among our correctional settings, but particularly including the differences within our, with our facilities, because there could be different operations at different facilities and particularly between the men and the women's facility. Um, and Woody Page, up, what I heard, Woody Page up at healthcare committee also asked about the out-of-state beds. So that's why that was added in there too. Mental health services provided to Vermonters in the out-of-state facilities. So that's new. Um, the other thing that they were concerned about, our medical and mental health uh, services are provided with an entity we contract, Vital Core. They were concerned upstairs that um, that should be uh, an item as well, that there's an assessment of how to use the uh, for-profit entity that we contract out for healthcare services and how that affects the um, cost and quality of care for that. So that's an addition. Um, I have a question about that later okay. after. So why don't we go to Kurt? Have we hit your question yet, Kurt? Uh, mine's number, th uh, number three, uh, line 18, or actually line 19. Okay. So why don't you go, um, go with Sarah? Th this is something that's usually spotted. So anyway, the, the or at the end of that sentence, I'm, th I'm thinking it should be an and. Okay. That's usually something that they would pick up, but. Yeah, well, it's a draft. Yeah. It's a draft. Uh, Sarah and then Marcia. So um, this is interesting. I, I think it's interesting what they've added. And I'm just curious, how, how, what would the process, what is, how does the healthcare get evaluated in corrections in general? Like this is a general, you know, I, I we have like it doesn't go through that committee. It, it doesn't sound like, right? Like the way that, I mean, it's a. No, they can't, well, what happens is DOC just contracts out. And I yeah. don't know if there's gotta be oversight of that from the secretary of the agency of human services. It's not done in isolation within DOC. DOC goes out for the contract. And, um, but that's all in conjunction with the Secretary of the Agency of Human Services. This will be interesting. I think they'll get some interesting information, but also I'm just, it makes me wonder how we have oversight over that, that aspect of um, correction. So it sounds like it's something that we might be looking at next, next year. Mm -hmm. uh, Marsha? I was just wondering, uh... Something we haven't heard anything about this week, and I know we switched from Centurion to Vital Core, but how the MAT deal was doing, the MAT. Yeah, I've no one's mentioned that. it at all this year. I know. I've thought about that, and you know, I think I think part of it is because we're not in the building; we're doing everything on Zoom. And I think also it's a new committee that we have, and it was just trying to get our legs underneath us for the capital budget and then understand some of the nuts and bolts of DOC, of corrections policy before we get into deep dives. Like we didn't deal with Community High School of Vermont this year. Um, we haven't really dealt with how someone gets to an out-of-state bed. We didn't deal with MAT. We haven't really looked at the healthcare contract or mental health contract. We haven't done some of those items that we would do normally and I think again, because we're such a brand new committee and we're all working on Zoom, that it's really difficult. You gotta deal with the bills that are in front of you to get those out. And then, so we might be able to use some time between now and the end of the session for MAT, have Annie in 
and talk about? Well, I was just wondering if they, you know, if they used MAT for like to deal with a mental illness patient or something and kind of cover up. I don't know. And maybe this report will bring it out. Yeah, they might. They might. Uh, Kurt? Um, it's maybe an impartial answer if, if uh, Representative Coffey was what her question. But, but within DOC, there is there is a director of health care or something. Well, was it Ben somebody, I think it was, oh, last time? Yeah, yeah, and they may have changed. The person's a doctor. Oh, right. aside, yeah, but aside from that person, that's kind of a consultant half yeah. thing. But, but within the DOC department, there's a, there was a person who was, he was going down to, to Mississippi and over, making sure things were being done correctly. There, there's oversight within DOC. They don't just hire and, and right. say, okay, you guys go at it. But maybe that's not what, what Representative Coffey was asking. But were you I, looking... I remember, uh, it seems to me his name was, first name was Ben, but I can't remember much more remember, than They've that. had so much changes in there. I mean, we can get yeah. some folks in and really talk about this when we... It was hard enough bringing all the new folks up to speed in terms of what corrections is in the terminology. Yeah. And when you're dealing with probation and we've been dealing with, with furlough and we've been dealing with all of that, you kind of have to bring committee members along to, to know the different statuses and know the process in order to work on the legislation. So some of this other stuff got put aside because we just didn't have the Zoom capacity, Zoom room to do the, all of that deep dive. We'll do more deep dives next year when we're back in the building. So I just want to clarify, I think for Representative Taylor's question, my intent was, you know, to find out, I, I don't think it's exclusive of what you were talking about, Kurt, but it's also like, what are the mental health services that we get in this contract? Like, what what do we get for, for um, in this coverage of, this is a this is one of the biggest healthcare systems in the state. <laughs> and so what do, I think what this, what's good about this bill is it kind of gets at that, like what's covered um, in comparison to the quality and the kind of care that you can get outside of corrections, I think is where the healthcare committee is coming from. So I think it's gonna yield some interesting um, reports and, discuss, and lead to some good discussion. <laughs> And then number four, I believe may be new. This one, assessment of whether the Department of Mental Health should provide oversight authority um, with whom the DOC contracts for healthcare services. And that will be, a, hmm, that's gonna be interesting. And then um, you know, whether the MOU that's currently in place is adequately addressing the needs of those individuals with severe illness or in need of inpatient. Now, who was here when we did that work for MOU with them and DMH? Was it Marsha and Mary? And Lynn, were you on the committee then? I think that was three, four years ago we did that, right? We did a lot which, of work this, on that. Hmm? Which MOU is this? But Mental is this health? the one? DOC. It's is this the one that I was talking about before where the, yeah, Where's I was here. Beds aside. Yeah, Kurt, Kurt was here. Yeah. Yep. So it was one, two, three, four, five of us, right? We're here. Okay. I was here physically, but I don't know whether I was. Your mental. I don't know if I was, I don't know if I was paying attention. <laughs> that was my Kurt. first, my was first Kurt session. Here. Right? I was Kurt, pretty snowed Kurt, under. You're all, yeah. Kurt, you're always paying attention. Yeah, we had yeah, a lot of people uh, sitting in the room at that point. I remember that one. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people sitting, all this, a lot of stakeholders and lots of folks. And I think we did MAT that year too. <laughs> we had good work. <laughs> that was Representative Connor's work. Whose work? Representative Connor. Oh, Dan Dan. Connor, that's what he wanted. He was on there, wasn't he? Yes, he was Dan. when he was there. Yeah. And Butch was the lead person on MAT. Mm -hmm. Butch, Butch did a lot of work on MAT. He was one of the lead folks on that one. Well, we know it wasn't supposed to cost millions. It was supposed to cost thousands. <laughs> we had to go up to appropriations with our tail between our knees. 
<laughs> between our legs on that one. <laughs> we did it. Um, okay, so that's what they've done to section five. Now that's their draft. And then section six is the forensic working group. And this is where they've really done um, some work in it. And we had testimony from uh, Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner Fox and Commissioner Baker on this. And this is the direction that they worked up with Deputy Commissioner Fox. Um, and it would be this working group would have the interested stakeholders that would provide expertise and recommendations on how to carry out sections B and C. And the concern was with the language as it was introduced in the bill, seemed very prescriptive that yes, we're doing a facility. And they wanted to really clarify that, that we're not at the point of doing a facility. Uh, we're at the point of trying to figure out how to deal with the competency issue and how to re restore competency. That was really the focus. Um, so the language is to reflect that. So if they're not doing a facility, then they've taken out BGS because there's no need to look at trying to find a facility space. So BGS is taken out in terms of who is listed. And I think, and they've also changed who is on there as well. Yeah, hi, I wanted to go 15 uh, people. Picked up probably between Michelle, three Michelle three can you, Michelle, can you uh, mute yourself, uh -huh. please? Michelle? Can, Michelle, can you mute yourself, please? And actually, it'll be, my husband's gonna do the pickup, so let's say Ron. I, yeah. I will do that. Yeah, she is she ordering pizza you, for all of us? Yeah, yeah right. Send can you, way. Can like, you mute uh, us all so I can unmute? <laughs> okay, great. Um, so they did change the makeup of the group a little bit. Yeah, it's got 15 people. So you've got DOC, which was on there before, and then you get Dale. Disability, Aging, and Independent Living. Uh, then you've got states, attorneys, and sheriffs, which was on there before. The attorney general was on there before. Defender general was on there before. So then now you've got the director of healthcare, no, director of healthcare reform was on there before. Um, a representative appointed by Vermont Cares, that was there before. Legal aid, that was there. Two uh, crime victims represented by the center that was there and the mental health ombudsman. That there was a couple there. things that are not there that were. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out. There was BGS, you got Voss on there. You got two, you've got two individuals instead of one with lived experience and mental illness and any other interested party permitted by the commissioner of mental health. So which ones did you pick up at all that we didn't put in? Well, we heard that from Judge, the Chief Justice that right. somebody from judiciary right. would the be judge. good to include since they're on all the other working groups on related subject matter. There was a judge and the Medical Society. And Vermont Medical Society is my other note. Um, and I don't know if that's covered by... Vaz. Yeah. Covered by Vaz. Yeah. But Voss was on there to begin with, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. No, Voss was not on there. Yes, they were. Yeah. Voss was on there. So, yes, they were. So that, I think then, then I would say that the Vermont Medical Society didn't see themselves as being included in that and they had asked to be part of it. I don't, but that's, that's, that's healthcare committee's world, not mine, ours, so. Well, I can relate that to Bill. Yeah. You don't want it too big either. So then they have this coming back. Where am I here? They did change the date too for this. No, nope, they didn't. August 1st. It's still August 1st. Okay. 
too many pieces of paper. This is where you need your legislative staff to walk you through, not have your chair. So then they said by February 1st of next year that they would submit a preliminary report to our respective committees on any of the gaps that they're starting to see. And that's what Deputy Fox mentioned. They could do it kind of sequential, phase, it at, phase in the reports, because it's going to be very involved and entailed. Um, and this is what the report would need to include. So they've really rewritten this whole section. Review competency restoration models, including how cases where competence, competency is not restored, how that's addressed. So it really focuses on re restoration of competency instead of a facility. Remove models, review models used in other states to determine public safety risks and means used to address the risks. Consider due process for defendants held without adjudication of a crime and recommend processes regarding other mental conditions affecting competency or sanity, which could include intellectual disabilities, TBI, and dementia. And then based on these recommendations in this preliminary report, um, the department would then submit a secondary report, a second report to Legislative Oversight Committee on or before July 1st of next year on whether a forensic treatment facility is needed in Vermont. So it'd be a good year to determine that. And then a year from this next January, which is a new biennium, newly elected representatives and senators would then receive a report, the final report on any uh, recommendations that are made going forward. So that's in a, in a real nutshell, I think. The other thing too that they're really concerned about upstairs is this is gonna take some resources because it's not just looking in state, they're also gonna have to be drawing on professionals from other states. So uh, Representative Lippert gave both rep myself and Representative Grad a heads up that they're gonna, well, we need to really discuss resources which means the bill then goes up to appropes and talk to the chair of appropes for resources. So that's where we are. Um, I don't think we wanna get in depth in this this afternoon, it's really, but I think the direction that the healthcare committee is really helping us. Do folks feel that way? I think it's really helping us because we were really playing catch up just in understanding forensic because it was a new world to so many folks in the committee where healthcare kind of deals with that because um, they have mental health in their purview. So they're more aware of some of these moving pieces than we are. We're more aware of the corrections piece to it. So I appreciate the work that they did, um, but I wanted the committee to make sure that you're in the loop to see what's happening upstairs. So Alice, we will be taking it up Tuesday or no? I'd like to take it up Tuesday. And Phil, I don't I, I know we don't really have much of a schedule for next week per se, but I think on Tuesday afternoon, if we could find uh, if we could see if we could get Katie McClinn. Um, or somebody maybe from healthcare to help present this to us or give us an update on where healthcare committee is. Is it only on sections five and six? Yes, yes. Yeah. That's all we're looking at. That's right, because because as I said, House Judiciary would like to kind of have a what we're feeling on Wednesday morning. Mm -hmm. So we need to work on this Thursday, Tuesday afternoon. And I know that 
Representative Lippert wanted to bring it up in his committee this afternoon. So we may there may be a new draft. Chances are there probably will be a new draft on this after today. So we'll we got to figure that out, Phil. So you might want to connect. You might want to connect with their committee assistant. Okay. See if we can stay in the loop that way. All right. And connect with Katie and see where she is. Or and when you connect with your counterpart up in the healthcare committee, maybe there'd be a member person could reach out and see if there could be a member from that committee that could come down to our committee and present it if Katie can't. Okay. Let's kind of coordinate there for Tuesday afternoon. S3 is all they're working on today according to their agenda. Yeah, yeah. So any, I got the cell phone, I got the other phone here. And I'm gonna mute myself. <laughs> okay, now it's going to voicemail. Um, anything else before we finish up for the week? Our work is winding down, yippee. We're doing good. I know we're tired. We're tired. It was a nice having. Are, 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 are there any thoughts of what the Senate has done with the Capitol bill? <laughs> yes. Well, sort of. Yes. I can only imagine. We're going two things. Oh, dear. The it's very like, qualies. <laughs> that's all it is at this point. So, <laughs> Senator Benning's going to come in and talk to us. Oh, goody. <laughs> He's going to come in and talk to us. He's he offered. I was going to suggest it. Um, their real concern is sinking of the Adirondack, and they are going to allow the reefing of the Adirondack. Senate Natural Resources Committee did sign off on that because the permit had already been issued by D. Um, D. That shouldn't have even been a factor. No. Well. <laughs> He, he has some legal opinions, legal um, uh, from Michael O'Grady, uh, legal analysis. And uh, he wants to go over that with us, that you can't undo a permit that's already been issued. Well, let's well, just say that should have never has. even been done. I know, but. Why do we even talk about it, right? <laughs> so that's one piece. And the other piece, they're looking for money for walleyes. <laughs> Aren't they always <laughs> yeah, looking for money for walleyes? Tell them to fish for the salmon. So that, so they, that's, all, so that's all they did, period. <laughs> that's that's what I'm picking up at this point. Oh my hey, God. we did excellent work. Mary, the Mary queen of that will be the berry. That's why <laughs> they didn't have bothered to go through the rest of it. They're working on the rest of it. So, Kurt, you, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, is the is the Senate worrying about the language that goes with the 1.5 million for um, corrections? I think they're they. I'm not sure. I think they're looking at. I think they're comfortable with the language we put in. Is what I'm seeing. And BGS, I think, is gives them enough direction to figure out where to go between now and January, and and be a little bit more. Um, they've got to do preliminary work and then come back in January and then really dig into um, knowing the lay of the land going forward. I mean, everybody's in agreement we replace the women's facility with, a, with both a reentry facility and a um, incarcerated facility. Everybody's in agreement with that. Nobody disagrees with that. So that's a yeah, big step but... forward. That's a big okay. step forward. So they're all in agreement with that. So we're on the same path. We're on the same I, way. I know Joe Benning is, is, he says, come on, let's stop talking about it. Let's do something. And that was surprising coming from Joe, I thought, but. Yeah, we're two, two years late. We were yes. ready two years ago. We certainly were. 
So they're working on that. Um, so when the bill comes out of Senate institutions, which will probably be next Tuesday, it then goes to Senate Appropes and it will probably be back to us by the end of the week because they don't hang on to things very much over there. So, and I know that Joe is really working not to have a conference committee. So um, that would be great. And I'm assuming we would really know what's in the bill. We'll know on the 20th, but that could change a little bit in the Senate approach, depending. So end of next week, for sure, if not before, we'll be doing a little bit of work on that and then go from there, concur maybe, we'll see. Uh, Karen. Yeah, a question on that process, just hearing that they um, passed it by their um, natural resources committee. Is that something that we would consider or explore? We could, but it's a day late and a dollar short. <laughs> we were just kind of caught. I think if we were in the building and there would have been more, you could have coordinated better with other committees. That's what happens when you're in the building. There's a lot more coordination that happens because you run into everybody. There's a lot of things this year that have just, you know, because you're not coordinating. Yeah, you don't have access. You know, like the, the chair of Natural Resources Committee sits in the row behind me on the floor. And during a break, it's like, oh, you know, we've got this issue. Do you guys want to look at it? Those kinds of things now take an hour to have a conversation with a colleague where normally you could just lean over during, we're in recess for five minutes. You can just run, run over and talk to somebody. Um, and now it's just taking <clears throat> so much longer and the bandwidth just isn't there, the energy. I mean, people are exhausted just taking care of what's in their committee as it is. But the permitting process for DEC was already going through the process when we started working on this. The time to have really dealt with it ahead of the permit was really last year. And we should tell them that we're not gonna give them any money, to clean, any more money to clean up Lake Champlain, they can do it themselves. I have to send Joe that message. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm gonna call him. <laughs> well, you tell it from you and me. Don't they need Probably. funding? Don't they need funding to sink this thing or something or you set know, up We their... just gotta buy the buoys. Just gotta buy the, well, so. I don't know. Money to buy the buoys. Did you, anybody see the, uh, thing in seven days about trace of PFAS detected in Shelburne water no, in seven days. That that, yeah, yeah. yeah I read that and we have it up here in Morgan in one of the schools. Yep. Yeah, well, yeah. then they're going to tear down Burlington High School. Well, now tear down they tear the down. one in Morgan. Yeah. There's yeah. no way for Burlington High School that they can rehab that thing. They're going to yeah. have to. Well, well they tried that, Alice, the day that you weren't there when they come into committee, remember? What? They tried to get into new school that day that you wasn't in committee. What you were held that? up with John down at uh, Dartmouth. Oh. And we come in and they ripped us one, called us stupid, said we, they knew that we, they had, that we had money and we should be giving it to them to help out the schools. I mm. that one, I missed that one. Yeah. yeah. Mm. We so were stupid. Kurt has his <laughs> hand up. <laughs> um, you know, we still have at least a month left. I've I've got plenty of things that uh, I'd like to uh, deal with if we have the time. Yeah, we will. I mean, there's there's my parole bill, and I'd I'd still like to go over the uh, DOC budget in detail and figure out what they're doing with um, transitional housing and the funding of that. Mm -hmm. And there's there's plenty that I'd like to get done if we have time. I can I think I've given a list to various people. I think Sarah may have a list too. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, let's uh, It's about balancing it with our time on the floor too, I think is what we're going to be heading into. But I, I agree with yeah. a, lot, a lot of those those thoughts that you have. Um, yeah, I do have the lists, Kurt, I do. <laughs> because we're going to have Wednesday and Thursday mornings, I think, for a little bit. And we didn't do anything for next week because we had too much in the, at play on Wednesday. We knew S45, we had to get that through. S3 at that point was, I was, we were under the impression, both Bill Lippert and I, that we had to get it out by Friday. That's eased up a little bit. 
Hmm. We knew we were going to be tied up on the floor on Thursday. So we weren't sure how S45 and S3 were going to work. And now there's more pressure to get the capital bill out earlier in the Senate. Senator Benning said to me, he said, I thought I had all of next week to get the bill out. He doesn't. So thank you for telling me that because I'm going to ask him what he's sitting on it for, like he does us. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, whenever that comes over, how entailed that's going to be, could be real easy or it could be really entailed. Um, and, <laughs> and then we've got. And are we going to follow up with H the HOK? or something we're going to at least as a committee to have some discussion yep. i would think yep. so you know and you have kurt's list so there are some dangling items out there but i think we just got to get through this week last night was brutal on the floor yesterday was really brutal this was marcia marcia could we listen in when you talk to uh <laughs> senator benning <laughs> Well, you know, he works Saturdays. I have his work number here, so it won't be the first time I call him, and I can hear him now. Yes, Martel, what do you want? Tell him you got baked beans. Yeah, just tell him he's not getting any unless he gives you an answer. I'll tell him that. He can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> so we're done for the week, folks.